Resuming debate. Resuming debate. Resuming debate. Greetings. Welcome back to another episode of the Resuming Debate podcast. I'm your host, Member of Parliament, Garnet Jenis. It's a pleasure uh, to be with you. So my province, Alberta, has a new premier. Danielle Smith ran uh, in the United Conservative Party leadership race on a platform emphasizing provincial sovereignty. Uh, and there's still a little bit of, uh, of unfolding to, to what is precisely meant in terms of the way she speaks about sovereignty. Uh, she's offered some description of, of a proposal for a sovereignty act. But she's also said that this legislation specifically will be drafted in consultation with her with her caucus in terms of some of the uh, specific aspects and provisions. So I should disclose uh, up front that uh, that I was involved in that leadership race and I did support a different candidate. And I was somewhat critical during that leadership race of some of the things she was saying. But nonetheless, I want to congratulate Danielle Smith on her victory. I certainly wish her very well and personally continue to believe very strongly that conservative governments are best for uh, for Alberta and for all uh, jurisdictions. Now, I wanted to drill down in this episode on one specific aspect of this uh, sovereignty conversation. I, I found it particularly interesting to see the way that Quebec is now being talked about in Alberta politics. Uh, at certain times, uh, there was uh, maybe from certain quarters a kind of uh, uh, knee-jerk criticism of, of, of Quebec, uh, but that has now been replaced by this strong current of what I would call Quebec envy in Alberta politics. Uh, that is, uh, Alberta provincial politicians uh, talking about how uh, Quebec has been, uh, in their perception, very successful at, uh, at getting a great deal from the federal government over, over uh, successive decades, uh, and, uh, and also developing some of its own um, more autonomous institutions, a pension plan, an immigration system, uh, its own tax collection. Uh, and, um, and one of the talking points for those that have been driving this discussion in Alberta has been saying, we just want to have what Quebec has. Uh, so today, uh, I'm very pleased that our guest for this discussion is my colleague and friend, Gerard Deltel, a real live Quebecer who is going to, uh, to share uh, for Albertans from the Quebec experience. Uh, Gerard, I know him as a, as a colleague in the Conservative Party, but he's a former leader of a provincial party in Quebec, and he was a journalist uh, before that. So Gerard, you can bring decades of knowledge and experience of the Quebec reality. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you, Garnet. Always a pleasure to chat to you, and what a great opportunity you gave it you, you gave to me to chat with all the thousands of people who are listening to us today. And uh, thank you so much for the invitation. And I have also to disclose a few issues right now: is that I've never been involved in provincial uh, uh, politics in Alberta, and I do not intend to start my <laughs> career right now. So this is a proactive. Uh, disclosure. I know Madame Smith. I met her uh, in Montreal around 10 years ago when I was leader of the Action Démocratique du Québec, who merged with the Coalition Amir Québec, which is now the government in Québec for a second mandate. Uh, but I'm not, I have absolutely nothing to do with the campaign of Madame Smith and who, who, who other else. Uh, I just support the Conservative Party, obviously, in Alberta. I prefer to have a Conservative than the NDP. But uh, I am not involved in any uh, any uh, jurisdiction, and especially in Alberta, in the provincial politics. You know it better than me. Well, I'm glad we both got our, our disclosures uh, out of the way. I had to disclose my involvement, and, yes. and you uh, wanted to mention your lack of involvement. Um, uh, <laughs> but really, I mean, my goal yes. in talking to you is, is uh, I think... Quebec has become a, a talking point in, in Alberta politics. So let's hear about, about the reality. Mm -hmm. um, how do Quebecers see their relationship to Canada? And obviously there's a spectrum there, but what are the different yeah. schools of thought? And what does the word sovereignty mean in the yeah. Quebec context? Very interesting question. As you know, Quebec is... Uh, quite special inside Canada, not because, you know, we are smarter or less smart or whatever, just because we are a population of six to seven million people. The first language is French. And I would say an ocean of 350 million people speaking English in North America. If you take our neighbor, if you take Canada, if you take us, uh, the French speaking people is very little compared to what people around us speak the, the other language, which is, which is English, which is a huge, a huge margin between 335 million to 
six to seven million. So this is why we are a little bit more concerned than anyone else about our specificity as a province and everything everything as a sovereignty uh, movement or ideas have been made inside the confederation for some exceptions, but the big deal of Quebec has always been, been inside the, uh, the confederation. Obviously, there is the separatist and independentist movement since I would say the 60s. Uh, René Lévesque created the movement, the Souveraineté Association, movement of association with sovereignty with, uh, with Canada, MSA, and then created the Parti Québécois in 1968. So this is, was the first time that you had a very strong uh, national, na national in the sense of Quebec, a provincial uh, party who would support, will, will fight for the sovereignty of Quebec. Sovereignty means to have a new country with an economic association with Canada. But there is, you know, they had uh, the, 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 the PQ got elected four times in our history, five times, sorry, one time, and the, the last time was uh, in 2012 as a minority government, but before that they had two, uh, two time back to back to, to mandate of uh, majority government. So in five, they had five government, they had two referendum, one in 1980 and uh, no one by uh, 60, 59 to 41. And another one in 1955 uh, with uh, 49 to 51, around that. It was very, very close in 1995. But since then, we had no referendum. And just to let you do something, you know, in Quebec, we talk about the losing referendum, the losing, the referendum that we lost. No, no, I won both. You know? <laughs> so yeah. so it is very interesting to see people talking about that. So there is a lot of experience that we have in Quebec with the so-called sovereignty uh, experience, but everything has been done inside the constitution, inside the constitutional frame that we have in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the sovereignty movement in Quebec means separation. And that's, I think, an important yes. point of understanding because some of the discussion in Alberta says, you know, we should have a sovereignty act. We should do what Quebec does. Well, OK, Quebec doesn't have a sovereignty act. In Quebec, there are sovereignists who are who are saying they want separation. But as a as a conservative Quebecer, uh, mm -hmm. who is a federalist, you, I think, are quite concerned about Quebec preserving its specificity at the same time, right? So, so how, does, um, how, how do um, federalists who are concerned about specificity, how do they advance their, their priorities? Uh, you, you wouldn't call yourself sovereigntist, I guess, but you, you, you'd, what, what, what's the language around that and what are the priorities there? Well, obviously, I'm a federalist, and I'm proud to be a Canadian as much as I'm proud to be Quebecois, and I'm sure as proud you guys from Alberta are proud to be Albertans and proud to be Canadian. So this is what I live. And, you know, just to remind you that we had the Parti Québécois in the last uh, election in Quebec just a week ago, that they got, uh, the, they had 15% only, with only three members of the National Assembly on 125. The worst result in their history. There is also the leftist party, which is Quebec Solidaire, which is a real true leftist party. I can assure you that NDP is on the left, but it's a joke. Uh, I'm joking. It's a, it's a pale situation compared to where Quebec Solidaire is when we talk about leftists. They are so-called sovereignists too, but they don't put a lot of emphasis on that. They are more socialist in their, in their blood, in their, in their skin, which is, I, I, I welcome that kind of diversity of opinion in democracy, but obviously it's not me, but they are more socialist than they are sovereignists. So yes, in the polls, we have around 30, 35%, whatever the, the poll that they are conducted, that there is separatist, independentist, sovereignist people, but, uh, and it is very important to understand that. Yes, I'm a Quebecois, I'm proud of my, uh, of my culture, I'm proud of my language, and I want to protect it, but, you know, it's not making me a, a separatist, not at all, as long as we do respect the Constitution. So, the first time that we had this distinction between Quebec and the other provinces was in the 50s, when the Maurice Duplessis government, the Union Nationale, which was a very right-wing uh, government and right-wing party, Union Nationale. And by the way, Mr. Duplessis was leader of the Conservative Party in the 30s, and they mixed with some other uh, some other uh, liberal dissidents, and they create l'Union Nationale. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he tabled the idea and adopted the idea to have a tax, 
um, how do we say that, a uh, rapport d'impôt, you know, you have to produce your taxation report on each and every year for the provincial and then for the federal. So this is why we are the only province in Quebec that we have to fulfill two uh, tax return, <laughs> tax, uh, ta tax process. So it's not very funny for us, but you know, this is why, because at that time, the federal government led by Mackenzie King and Louis Salera, and I, uh, Louis Salera is the name of my writing, was a very centralizator uh, government. And Louis, Maurice Duplessis said, if we want to, to assure our authenticity and what is our important for us is to have the power to grab uh, the money from the pocket of the people. But obviously we pay more taxes than anyone else in the, in the, in the country, but we decided as a society. So when we talk about sovereignty uh, movement or sovereignty jest, a proposer, you have that kind of example. Also, there is another issue which is very sensitive in Quebec and all around the, the, the country. It's when we talk about immigration. What is interesting is that, you know, the Quebec government had the first Department of Immigration with the Minister of the, or Immigration since 1968. And there was a lot of uh, accord of uh, mutual uh, support from the federal government and the provincial government during the Pierre Elliott Trudeau's year. So it's not to please for a separatist people because everybody everybody knows that Justin, that Pierre Elliott Trudeau was everything but a good guy with separatists, was everything but that. But he recognized that Quebec with the specificity of its people, that most of the people speak French in an ocean of uh, English speaking people, they need to have some, we could call protection for immigration. But that has been done under Thierry Le Trudeau who was everything but a friend of the separatists. So yes, and everything mm -hmm. of that has been achieved inside the Canadian constitution, inside the Canadian confederation. So if you guys from Alberta would like to have some kind of deal with, uh, with uh, Ottawa, no problem. It's all written in the constitution. And if we respect the constitution, we mm -hmm. could respect the will of whatever the people, wherever the people are, as long yep. as we respect the constitution. And to tell you the truth, the best way to kill the separatist separatist sentiment in Quebec is to is, is to being respectful of the constitution. That's exactly. And it's not because I'm a conservative that I'm saying that, but we have seen that we have seen the separatist movement in Quebec falling down under the Harper's years. Why? Not because Harper was smarter than anyone else. Yes, he was, but it's not for that. But Mr. Harper was a truly respectful man for the constitution. Ottawa, do whatever you do, and provinces, do whatever you have to do. And if every day everybody respect that frame, there is no problem. It's only yeah. when you see some federal politicians say, oh, I know what is good for you in Alberta or in Quebec about health care. No, it's a right. provincial jurisdiction respect the constitution and then you will have no more yeah. uh, separatist ambition in this country yeah no and I, I think that's a really important point it's one that certainly i agree with is that when you have respect for the constitutional competencies of provincial governments uh, that you you don't have the same kind of national unity problems in in any jurisdiction uh, so just thinking about the comparison between alberta and quebec i think there's, there's a few things that that people might say in terms of, of the points you made about, about the specificity. One is, how important is language really to thinking about specificity? I mean, there are many different uh, nations, people, groups that may speak the same language as their neighbors, uh, but be really attached to their specificity. Uh, you know, most Canadians are English speaking in relation to Americans. You know, we have the same language, but, but we see ourselves as distinct. You know, in Alberta, I think, um, you know, we, we have we have a, a different history around. I mean, our, our history is maybe similar to Saskatchewan's, but, you know, um, we have a bit of a different ethnocultural mix, less English, more more kind of uh, diversity, more, more people from Eastern Europe and other other places um, in our in our early settlement. Um, we have a, a little bit more of a closeness to the a sense of closeness to the pioneer experience, although Alberta's become very urbanized as well. And energy, ener oil and gas, we, we have we, we see our specificity in terms of our, our economy. So I, I guess, you know, I, I obviously a big part of Quebec specificity is language. Language isn't the only factor. Quebec has a different history around religion and some other. But so so what would you say to those who challenge the um, uh, the argument that that language is such a defining defining factor and maybe who would say hey um 
even though Alberta has the same uh, speaks the same language as, as as eight other provinces or I guess seven other provinces, think about New Brunswick, um, but we can still we still have our distinctiveness that we have to preserve and that is threatened from uh, uh, from other parts of the country or North America that that see things differently. Well, first of all, about the language, uh, Mr. Hopper and I will quote him again this uh, this time. Mr. Hopper used to say Canada was born in French because the first European settler to have a settling uh, for a long term, which was the creation of Quebec City, where I live, by the way, in 1608, it was uh, Samuel de Champlain from France. So this is why, you know, since more than 400 years, we speak French here in this part of the, of the world. And so this is why Mr. Harper used to say, uh, Quebec, uh, Quebec, Quebec is the birthplace of Canada, and uh, Champlain was my predecessor. And this country was founded in French. Obviously, mm. we have to think about the First Nation. But when we talk about the European people, we're talking about the first settler. And we're talking on the permanent basis. We're talking about Champlain. We're talking about Quebec City. We're talking about the French. So obviously, and I will repeat it again and again and again. We are six to seven million people speaking French in an ocean of 350 million people. But, you know, when I was on the provincial uh, level, I tabled an idea because I was a provincial level for seven years, and I had an idea to have Quebec Francais, Québécois bilingue. The Quebec of the province of Quebec, French, but I mean, in an institution, but the people should be bilingual because it's not because you're so proud of your uh, mother tongue, as, as I am from for, about, Fran, about French, that I will put aside the privilege and the, uh, the, the pleasure to speak another language. So it's not because you want to speak two languages that you want to put aside your mother tongue. Absolutely not for the language. So absolutely not. It's a plus. It's a, it's wealthy to have to, to, to be able to speak two official the two official language of our of our country. So this is why the language is so important. But also you have different uh, way to live also in Quebec. Uh, we don't have the common law, we have the civil code yeah. to, to, to order our justice system. I'm not a lawyer, I am a neither a liar, but I'm not neither a lawyer. And that's one of, one of the first mistakes I've made in 2008 when I was in the House of Commons, by the way, I talk about liar instead of lawyer. And the speaker uh, raised the concern to me and I said, okay, I will, I will be yeah. careful next time. So, you know- I, I don't want to offend any lawyers by, by making further comments about the similarities there, but uh, sorry, go yes, on. <laughs> maybe some, but uh, we have to be careful because yeah. they, can, they can pursue us. So. Yeah. Uh, yes, there is some different aspect, but obviously, when we talk about the language, but also keep in mind that people from Alberta have different topics than people from BC and from yeah. people from Quebec, from Ontario. Yeah. And since I'm at the federal level, I can discover that, you know, in Quebec, we're talking a lot about the rock, the rest of Canada. But tell yeah. you the truth, and it's almost a joke, but it's not a joke. The, the real rock in my mind, it's not Quebec and the rest of Canada, but it's Toronto and the rest yeah. of Canada. <laughs> this is my true, my true uh, vision yeah. of what is the rest of Canada. So, and you know, in Toronto, you have some, some boroughs who are in the, that kind of people and so This is what life is all about. Yeah. This is what life is all about. We're always talking about United States, that everybody is, is united. Yes, but the guy from Maine are not the same from Ohio, from Ohio, and the guy from Iowa, Wisconsin, is not the same from California. And in California, you have those guys from San Francisco are not exactly the same of San Clemente. This is what life is all about, and yeah. we have to preserve that. We have to be proud of that. Yeah, at the end no, of the day, we, we are Canadians. Yeah, absolutely. I guess the next step from recognizing yes. and celebrating that diversity is the question of of quote unquote nationality, right? Because there's, you know, Quebec sees itself as, a, as you know, nation, par, part yeah. of that language history. Quebec sees itself as a nation. And certainly the Federalists would say a nation within, within a united Canada. What is, what is your reaction? What is the reaction of people in Quebec to um, Albertans, uh, Saskatchewanians who believe very much in, in aspects of their distinctiveness and specificity, uh, but it's not tied to language, uh, it, who, who see themselves as, you know, maybe saying, hey, we're, we're a nation too. Well, when we talk about nation, and there is a lot of debate when we had that debate uh, in 19, uh, 2006, when the Prime Minister Harper recognized Quebec in the nation without, uh, within Canada. And just to make a point, at that time I was a journalist, and I remember pretty well in uh, February or March 2006, Prime Minister Harper paid a visit to Premier Jean Charest at that time. 
And I asked him the question. I said, Prime Minister Harper is Quebec a nation, yes or no? And he didn't answer clearly at that time. Uh, but few few weeks or few, I would say, no, I think it was few months, few months later, the House of Commons officially recognized Quebec as a nation within, uh, within Canada. But nation in French, doesn't mean nation, uh, nation en français, mm. doesn't mean nation in English. So this is why it was tough for English speaking mm. people to, to, uh, to, re to recognize it. And I do respect this, this difference. Premier Charret told me the, exactly the difference at that time when I was a journalist and obviously later when I was a politician that mm. there is a big distinction in French and in English. And you know, as long as we respect the fact that Quebec is quite different than uh, other other community or their province just you know just for the civil code for the justice yeah. frame that we are working on just the fact that we speak another language that all the other nine, nine provinces it's just the fact you know is that the, the reality that it's quite different and then i'm always upset when i hear people talking on behalf of quebec no yeah. no one is talking on behalf of quebec everybody are talking on behalf of Quebec. We, there is 78 members in the House of Commons. There is uh, Alexandre Boulris from the NDP. There is a, a plenty of uh, people from the Bloc Québécois. There is a majority member from the from the Liberal of Justin Trudeau, and there is 10 of us as a conservative uh, minding people. So this is why you know Quebec is not a bridge. Quebec yeah. is not you know a monolithic uh, a body. It's different, like it's like I would say, Red Deer is different than Calgary Center. Yeah. And this and, uh, and Mountain Center is not exactly the same than when, when you look at the Cold Lake. Well, yeah. this is what Canada is all about. And we yeah. shall respect those differences as long yeah. as we recognize that we are Canadians. Yeah. So um, I think one, one question that's really top of mind for people here is, would a sovereigntist movement be good for our interests. So do you think, and I know the words are being used a bit differently, but what do you, how would you evaluate the impact on Quebec of the separatist movement? You mentioned, I think it's important to note that some of the changes you mentioned go back to Duplessis, so they predate the, uh, the separatist movement actually, but is Quebec better off today than it would have been if there had been no separatist movement or is it worse off, do you think? Always difficult to say so because, you know, yes, the Parti Québécois was a separatist party, but they had only, they, they did that only two months in our history. In 1980, in May 1980, and in uh, October uh, 1950, 1995, period. Mm -hmm. The rest of the time, you know, they run as a provincial government. And mm -hmm. during those two referendum campaign, obviously they were talking about separation uh, 24 hours, seven days a week on those two moments. But except that, they run the province like a provincial government mm -hmm. with the respect of the constitution, always asking to be respected by the constitution. Yeah. So this is the main difference. So this is why, you know, we, we, they had deal with Pierre Elliott Trudeau's government, which is everything but a sympathy, the, the, mm -hmm. the sympathetic to the separatist movement. It's everything but that. But they deal it because they recognize at that time, and still this is the case right now, that if we want to preserve the, the society and the language that we have, we have to be uh, more specific when it's time about uh, immigration. And that doesn't mean that we, won't want to, we do not want to see people from all around the world coming here. But there is a, a, a fact that if we want to preserve the French, there is an aspect that we shall to keep in mind each and every time we welcome people. And by the way, I'm son of an immigrant. So mm. I'm the, the living proof that uh, we welcome immigrants uh, in Quebec. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but just in, ter in terms of like trying to pull out the, like the impact, and, and it's always hard to evaluate these sort of historical counterfactuals, like what would have been different if. Um, but one of the things that the critics of the Sovereignty Act or movement in Alberta said is that... Um, that Quebec lost a lot of uh, a lot of investment. That there was sort of a, a a lack of confidence and a fear around where the separ separation thing was going, um, and that 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 contributed to uncertainty. Um, uh, how how does that play into an evaluation of the the effects of uh, of this whole discourse? Well, obviously, this is the truth. Uh, when the PQ was elected on November the 15, 1976, uh, the, the, the following years, 
we have seen a lot of investment uh, leaving the province and going in Toronto. There is some sarcasm about the fact that the greatest achievement of the uh, Parti Québécois government is Toronto, because Toronto was the second biggest city in Canada. And after the PK's government, it was a metropole of Canada, which, uh, which was a title lost by Montreal. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a cartoon, this is sarcastic, but part of truth if you look closely at the, at the numbers. But you know, it's, it's no more the case when we talk about that because everybody, Premier Charest, when he was Premier of Quebec said that, yes, technically speaking, Quebec can be a dependent on the fiscal measure and the financial. There is no shame to say that and to recognize that. But I think, and even Francois Legault, Premier of Quebec was with a former uh, biggest senior cabinet minister and decided to put aside the idea of the sovereignty, realizing that, uh, well, there is no appetit for, uh, for Quebecois for this debate anymore. And we want to, to focus on the economy of the prosperity of our people and having a good government instead of trying to, to create a fight with the rest of Canada and everything. So yeah. there is a lot of people, yeah. Yeah, so I guess what I'm what I'm distilling from what you're saying is this picture of how, uh, you know, sometimes when there's this new force on the scene, it has a really disruptive effect, but then in some ways that new force can absorb itself into the system and start to play by the existing rules of the system. So you have the, the separatist, sovereigntist movement coming on the scene, disruptive force, investment, you know, investment is chased out, but but then there's this process of, of of actually the separatists talking less and less about separation and getting absorbed into the system. There might, there's probably an Alberta, Alberta parallel for that going back to the social credit government. We had this social credit government that came in with this very radical agenda that was ruled ultimately unconstitutional. Um, and then it kind of uh, transformed itself into a, a, you know, a mainstream establishment force yep. that went on to rule the province for for 40 years, even though a signature program couldn't be implemented. So um, is that is that sort of the picture here of disruptive force, but then that gets gets absorbed? Obviously, technically speaking, people, the investors prefer to have stability. And this yeah. is true for whatever the investment you want to do. You want to know where, where what, what thing will happen. Yes, you can accept to have you know a different government. So obviously, <laughs> we shall respect the will of the people. This is what democracy is all about. But the investor will prefer to have stability, to have the same the same platform, the same frame, political frame. This is you know a universal reality, whatever the investment or the investor is or are. But when you have someone who would like to break the country and to have an independent country like we had in '76 and the, with the, the referendum in 1980 and the referendum in 1995, obviously there is some uh, turbulence and mm -hmm. people could be afraid. This is why uh, President Clinton said clearly two days before the referendum in 1995, uh, the White House called the journalist of CBC and Radio Canada to ask a question to President Clinton during a press conference just two days or three days before mm -hmm. the referendum to say, so what do you think about the Quebec referendum? And it was a clear, crystal clear message from President Clinton to say, well, we want stability and we uh, Canada is a great country and we want to preserve it. I remember pretty well Peter Jennings, uh, ABC's uh, anchor, who was born in, in Toronto and he was in Montreal the day of the, the October the 30th, 1995, the, the evening of the referendum. And he was you know, almost crying in front of the camera saying, well, maybe this country will be broken tonight if the Quebec people with the will is to, to decide to be sovereign and all, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, the history tells us that uh, Jean Chrétien called Bill Clinton to say, Bill, I need you right now. Please mm -hmm. help. It, 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 it is normal that when we see someone who would like to change the frame of the country, yeah. People, investors are a little bit concerned. That doesn't mean that they want to push away all their money, but yeah. maybe they will wait and see. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 really interesting. And then that frame sort of stabilizes at some point, right? Where people are like, yeah. "Well, this is this is just the frame going going forward." It, it seems that you know, following Quebec politics from a distance, but that the the emergence of this kind of middle option that emphasizes autonomy is probably. I mean, it is. It might be closer to what is talked about in Alberta as sovereignty, although in Alberta, there's, there's this question around rule of law and sovereignty. And, and I want to get to that. I want to ask your thoughts on that. But, but first of all, tell us about this sort of emergent middle option of autonomy um, and uh, Francois Legault's success championing that and also maybe how, how the block at the federal level doesn't talk very much about 
sovereignty or separation anymore either. There's kind of this new new reality. Uh, Thirty two years or no, not quite, but, but you know, no more than almost uh, you know quite quite a, a ways on from the last referendum. So almost thirty years, nineteen ninety five yeah. and two thousand twenty two. It's right. funny to see, and I, I I like to 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 laugh about my friends from the Bloc Québécois, and I do respect them. They have been elected, and I do respect whoever is elected. Uh, you know, they 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 are separatists, but they never talk about separation. And I used to say to them, "Hey, you guys, if you want, if you really believe in separation, you should be in the National Assembly instead of the House of Commons. It's in the National Assembly that we can adopt law that will affect uh, the rules of the people instead of here in the House of Commons." But, you know, I think they prefer to have uh, the life in uh, Ottawa instead of being one of the three elected members from the Parti Québécois, which was the case in the last election. We also have to keep in mind a, a very important point is that, as I said earlier, François Legault, the Premier of Quebec, very popular, as you know, has been re-elected with 90 members of 125. Um, is very popular in Quebec, even if he had some issue to address during the campaign. It was not an easy ride for him during the campaign, like any other else. But the point is that, as far as I'm concerned, he realized and recognized that there is no will from the people of Quebec to be separatist, to be independent, to be sovereign. So as long as this is the situation, as I feel it, this is why he decided to left the Parti Québécois and to create this party, Coalition Amir Québec, which means a future of Quebec, coalition of future of Quebec, coalition Amir Québec, uh, to, to have under the same umbrella, people federalists like me and former separatists like him. And by the way, I was leader of the Action Démocratique du Québec in those, in those years, and uh, two, 11 years ago, we merged with the Coalition Amir Québec, and François became, Surago became the lead, was the leader of this party. I never thought of running as a, a calling a leadership race. I knew it was, it was him, and it was all right for me. And by the way, Lego is a businessman, a very famous businessman, a successful businessman. He was one of the three creators of Air Transat. And as you, can, as you know, Air Transat is a running plane around the world. He's the one with the two, two other colleagues who create that. So he's a very successful businessman. This is why he's able to, you know, to, to understand and he's very popular. In, but he is a good, fr he's a good friend of Doug Ford and, and anything else. But when we talk about nationalism, when we talk about autonomy, we are not talking about separation. We're not talking about sovereignty because yeah. with the autonomy, with the nationalism, everything is inside the frame of the constitution. And let me be clear with one issue. When we talk about, you know, every province can adopt their own law. This mm -hmm. is the case in Quebec when we talk about the Bill 21. And I know this is a very difficult issue to address. And I do recognize that. But all Quebecois shall also know and recognize that if they can adopt that law, it's because of a conservative premier of Manitoba. Why? Because, yes, when there is, you know, in the, in the Constitution of 1981, there was a supremacy of the Charter of Rights. But Mr. Sterling Lyon, Premier of Manitoba said, but we have to, have to, to give the last word to the elected people instead of the Supreme Court member. So this is why he include in the constitution the notwithstanding clause, which is notwithstanding the Charter of Rights, you will apply that kind of rules. So this is why in the Bill 21, you had exactly an article about the notwithstanding clause that we is that is included in the constitution of 1981 and this has been tabled and promoted by the pre conservative premier of manitoba sterling lyon he decided in his mind and it was everybody agree on that at the end of the day the last word remained to the politician instead of the supreme court but this this notwithstanding clause is only for five years so in five years, you have another election, technically speaking, you know, because it's a five year mandate. So if a, a government adopt a law in the first year, in the next five years, you have to review the law with the new government. This new government could be the same party, but could be another party. So at the end of the day, is the people decide, not the judges, not the, the people of the Supreme Court, not the nine judge of the Supreme Court, but the people in their vote, in their will, and a, a week ago, we had an election in Quebec, and the CAC was re-elected.
Yeah. No, and, and thank you for that, that explanation. I think just on Bill 21, I want to mention that I did a previous episode on this. It's yep. episode nine for those who want to go back. And we spoke with a couple Quebecers uh, on that uh, show at, at that time. So folks can, can go back and look at that. It, it was released November 9th, 2021. So about a year ago. And I think some of the issues are very much still uh, still current. It's worth, worth a re-listen if you're only joining our podcast at this uh, later stage. And, and Gerard, it's interesting, I think in Alberta, there's in, in the discussion, uh, not from politicians, but from some of the comments I see on social media, there's a fair bit of misunderstanding around the notwithstanding clause, right? Where people think that it's kind of a, it, it, it lets you sort of do anything. You just say the notwithstanding clause and then you can, but, but the notwithstanding clause applies for a limited time frame, but also to to certain specific sections of the Charter of Rights. So you can't you can't just say, uh, notwithstanding this federal law, we're going to go a different direction. No, the notwithstanding clause is, is, is a very narrow section that, that, that applies to, to specific kinds of rights uh, and, and not to others. Um, and also, yeah. each and every province can use that. It's yes. not a Quebec, a Quebec, yeah. Quebec tool. It's a tool for everybody. And it was created by right. a conservative premier from Manitoba, Cyril and Honorable yeah. Sir Lyon. Yeah. No, and, and I guess one of the interesting things too about the notwithstanding clause, and it applies to some of the other provisions we could talk about and, and we'll, we'll get to in terms of the immigration system and other things. There are many areas where other provinces have abilities that they have chosen not to use, generally for local political reasons. Why does Alberta not have a provincial police force when Ontario and Quebec do? Well, it's because the, the democratic choice of Albertans up until now has been not to have their own provincial police force. There's nothing to stop them from creating a provincial police force. Um, it's not just Quebec, Ontario does as well. Um, use of the notwithstanding clause, I was just going to say, Quebec has extensively used the notwithstanding clause. Um, other provinces have, for, for local political reasons, uh, uh, chosen not to. Um, but it's not because they can't, it's because uh, the politics there is different. So, so one of the things that, that I used to sort of challenge people who, who talk about why can't Alberta be, be like Quebec? Well, in many respects, we could be, but voters have made different choices. This is the reason why we don't have the, the same level of autonomy in certain areas. And we could choose that. We could, we could choose to develop our own police force and other things, but that would even locally be a matter of, uh, of, of debate. I want, and I want to get to talking about some of those, those specific institutions, but let's just talk about the rule of law here, first of all, because I think this is, this is something you've brought up a few times. And this is a big question in the debate around the Alberta sovereignty movement, because, because part of the, the sovereignty movement has this sense of that a, a provincial government in Alberta, would, and, and it's still unclear, I think it's still being sort of roughed out, but that Alberta would in certain cases say no to federal laws. It's not uncommon for a province to to object to a federal law the res, and then therefore to challenge it in court it's also not unusual for a province to maybe uh have a different approach around enforcement uh of certain certain federal laws that that oftentimes those decisions are made at the local level and you know it's even while marijuana was was illegal in canada you had probably different approaches to enforcement that were that were regional and and maybe urban rural differences there there as well so you have a local setting of enforcement priorities you have uh, um, you know you have provinces challenging the federal government in court at the same time that's that that's all kind of within certain parameters but then the the question is what would it look like to step outside of that or could you step outside of that what happens if a provincial government just says, you know, we are we are opposed to this law and we don't think people here have to follow it. Could they do that? What would be the implications of, of sort of trying to go outside of the the process <laughs> of of court challenges or negotiations and just to say, no, we're going to do it on their on our own? Well, my, my concern with that is that uh, as long as you are uh, a legislator, you shall respect the law, whatever the law is. Uh, if you go to the United States, you disagree with some law, but you have to respect the, laws per, the law, period. And the same thing, you know, as a, as a lawmaker, which, well, which this is what we are, we can disagree. We strongly disagree with a lot of the laws that have been adopted by the Trudeau government, obviously. But, you know, we shall respect the rules. If we, if we don't respect the law, who will respect the law? And by the way, as a conservative, we are the party of the law and order. So mm -hmm. if by any means you have a provincial jurisdiction saying, no, we will not respect the federal law, well, nobody will respect your provincial law and your municipal regulation rules too. So this is why, you know, as a lawmaker, this is our first and four and first of all overall 
responsibility is to respect the law, even if we totally mm -hmm. disagree with the law. There is uh, plenty of room to change it, calling the justice system. And this is what, what we are, this is what we are, we live in a society that we have to respect the law. This is not the same process, the same framework of the justice system in Quebec than elsewhere, because we are under a Napoleon code in the, 18th, in the 19th century, and I'm not a lawyer, but I'm a little bit historian on that, so mm. I can explain that to you, but that remind me what the Premier, Prime Minister Harper used to say. Canada was born in French in, uh, in 1608 in Quebec City by Champlain, who is my predecessor. I love when I, And by the way, when he said that, it was at the 40th anniversary of Quebec City on July the 3rd, 2008. And at that time, I was a journalist just a few, mm -hmm. year, a few months before becoming a member of the National Assembly. And I remember pretty well when Prime Minister Harper said that this country was, has been born in, in French. And I said, well, that's great. And so this is why I'm a conservative. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, so your your point being that law is the foundation of what we do, right? And that uh, in a way, it le legislators that that um, that show disregard for law are, are undermining that that foundation. Uh, from what I understand, the history there has never really been a, a a prominent voice of in Quebec pushing autonomy or separation uh, outside of a rule of law framework. At the so, same time, I think there is some dispute about. You know things like the application of of the Clarity Act, right? So oh, if yeah. if you had a provincial referendum that was not in line with the Clarity Act, you know you you could get to a situation of um, of unilateral declaration of separation, where a Quebec government thought they had the legal mandate to say we're leaving, and the national government said no. Um, you know, clear question, clear majority, duty to negotiate. Um, so there are some, although we haven't gone down that road yet, I think if you look at what could happen, um, there, there, there could be some, some stretching at these, at these rule of law fibers. I gather you, you thought a lot about this with some of the things that have unfolded. So, um, so, so how, how do you think a situation like that would play out in terms of the, the, the legal tensions that might exist and, and, and who settles it at the end of the day? I mean, if Quebec, if Quebec were to say, or Alberta were to say, uh, we're doing this differently, we're leaving, we're, you know, um, like who, how, how would that be adjudicated? Okay, that's, that's very interesting. There is three elements that I want to remind everybody. First of all, yes, there is no violence with the separatist movement, except when the Front de Libération du Québec, FLQ, uh, you know, killed people for their independence in the 60s, not only in, in October 70s, uh, 1970, but also in the 60s, they had, you know, bombed uh, in the mailbox and things like that. They killed around 10 people and among them, uh, cabinet minister, elected member of the National Assembly, Pierre Laporte. You know, that is terrible in our history. And uh, there is a lot of thing to say about that. Uh, but I think that uh, we have also to keep in mind that's the Quebec government who asked for the army. It's the Quebec government who asked for the uh, Loi des mesures de guerre, war measure. It's the government of Quebec under the Sûreté du Québec who drove the arrestation. And it's the Quebec government who gave money as a compensation to those who have been arrested without mandate. One, two, three, four four elements very important in our discussion and four elements that has been called by the Quebec government. I don't want to go there too much because there is a huge debate in Quebec about that and in Canada too, but except that worst nightmare that we had to suffer as a Democrat people in Quebec, the movement, separatist, the separatist movement was very, I would say, cool because there is no riot, even in 1980, and especially in 1995, when we're talking about less than 1% of difference between the yes and the no, and there was no riot in Quebec, no riot. People were upset, but there is no riot. So I'm very proud of my people from Quebec, you know, even if uh, we have family, di family div divided, friends divided, uh, workplace divided because of that, but there is no riot, no violence in Quebec on that on that field, and I'm very proud of that. So this is my second point, uh, and my third point is that 
I know that the Paris Zoo government in 1995 about the referendum, because everybody knows 1980 that the, 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 the no will pass and the yes will not be, Quebec will not be a country. But in 1995, even during the, the, the when we were looking at the polls uh, and the ballot vote, uh, sometime we think that, oh yeah, Quebec could be a country tonight. Uh, it was based on the international recognition. Mm -hmm. And it was set up that the France, uh, the French government, uh, Jacques Chirac will say, yes, we do recognize Quebec as a country now. But there is also a, a full year of negotiation that was written in the platform of the, the, of the question, of the, 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 the question that people had to, to answer, yes or no. Uh, so it was not, it, 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 you know, on the day after the referendum, there was no room at the United Nations for Quebec. You need to have discussion and negotiation yeah. with the federal government, but everything will be, will be uh, accepted if around the world people recognize that. And obviously uh, Bill Clinton was a good buddy of Jean Chrétien. Uh, nobody would know what, what could have happened. But on the yeah. other hand, if France recognized that, that will be a very big issue to address. And if, you know, the democratic system has been working, you know, the, the no won by only one person. So if we do recognize the victory of the no, we shall recognize the victory of the yes with only one person. You know, mm -hmm. we are Democrat or we are not. Obviously, it's more easy if you have that kind of yeah. change with a huge mandate. But democracy is 50 plus one. If we change the rules of that, you have to know it before instead of the ring. And yeah. tell you the truth, the question, the question of 1995 why was very more clear than the one yeah. of 1980. Yeah, so, so I guess the takeaway from that is, you know, post FLQ, which, which we need to remember and yeah. you know, honor the victims of and, and, and yeah. not forget that, but post FLQ, uh, the, um, the history of, of, of this debate is very much a democratic one. Yeah. And, and even uh, an absence of riots shows that, yeah. that there was an acceptance of, uh, of, of this. I mean, I, I guess one area where I would maybe probe a little bit is, um, uh, I guess one thing people ask is, okay, well, if Canada is divisible, then Quebec is divisible. And how do you count 50 plus one if you have uh, substantial regions within Quebec that are voting to stay with Canada. Um, and this is, I guess this is one of the problems with the question of, of national self-determination, which I very much believe in as a principle, uh, but you can, you can subdivide it and, and, and subdivide it. I mean, maybe a, a, a semi comparable case is that of Ireland, right? Where, yes. where, uh, um, Ireland was, um, Ireland was divided in such a way that that created um, a majority in in a part of it that wasn't a majority in what had up till then been the whole right, mm -hmm. um, and example. that's maybe where um, it, and so it 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 would be really challenging to work these things out. Now in Canada, we've shown a real capacity to negotiate uh, at the level of coming together. Would we show the same um, you know? Uh, Cool, coolness and ability to negotiate our own disintegration. I, um, but I, but I take the point. I think it's an important one for us in Alberta. Is just about about the commitment to having these debates democratically. Absolutely, and we shall respect the will of the people. And you know, we had we had the privilege in Quebec to have a very great democratic man, which is René Lévesque, uh, who fought a lot for democratic movement and fought a lot also to respect the will of the people. And yes, he fought for the independence, but he also fought for the also fought for the uh, to being respectful and do it exactly like it was supposed to be. So this is why he refused to. Call the, uh, the to call an independent to call independence without the support of a majority of the people by referendum instead mm -hmm. of a vote in the, the national assembly because 1976 he got uh, if my memory is correct 71 members of 110 mm -hmm. he could have called a shot you know could have said well this is the bill the bills the bill bill one Quebec yeah. is an independent country and the bill will have passed. No, he said no we need to have the support of the people instead of yeah. the support of the elected people. That's the real democratic action that we shall respect. Yeah. Um, so we're we're running out of time here, Gerard. This is a great, great conversation. Um, I want to go through at the end here. Let's talk about these institutions and find out how well they're working. Quebec's tax system, Quebec's immigration system, its police force, its pension system. Um, my sense is that those separate systems uh, 
reflect the broad consensus of Quebec society. Nobody is proposing going back to federal control or, or inserting federal control in any of those areas. Um, how well has it worked for Quebec to have these institutions? And um, what would you say to Albertans who, who might say, um, hey, Gerard, is this working well such that we should do the same thing? Well, that depends on the will of the people. We, we live with that. I was born, you know, in 1964. So all of those institutions have been under my, uh, I live with those institutions. I didn't know how it was before than it is mm -hmm. now. But what I do recognize is that, uh, yes, it's working. As long as we do respect, you know, the, 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 the jurisdiction, the provincial, the federal jurisdiction, we shall respect that. But also, we also have to recognize that it costs a little bit more. Uh, but, you know, it's those, those uh, institutions are designed by the will of the people, sometimes right, sometimes wrong, nothing is perfect. But we also pay a little bit more uh, to have that. And the, we have to be careful not to duplicate the, uh, the responsibility. And, uh, you know, sometimes the separatists told me, hey, they'll tell you're a conservative. Yes. You don't like bureaucracy. Yes. So eliminate one right, one level and everybody will be happy. Well, that's right. a good argument. <laughs> but I don't want to eliminate the provincial jurisdiction. Yeah, yeah. That's what I used to say to them instead of yeah. eliminating the federal government. But as a conservative, we also have, if we are respectful of the constitution, yeah, yeah. there is no duplication. But if we don't respect that, yes, there is a lot of duplication because it will cost yeah. too much. Yeah, I, it was especially bad, I think, during COVID, where it seemed like the federal government was so eager to talk about what provinces should be doing differently, and yet was failing on the basic level federally. And, you know, we continue to deal with this and, um, you know, hey, we're we're probably going to agree on this as, as two conservatives, right? But, but yes. you know, do you should, governments should try to be really excellent at delivering the services that are their responsibility. So federally passports, right? Like let's get passports exactly. right before. Yes. Um, and, and, but but it, it, I think it, 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 it hurts our democracy when people are confused about, you know, hey, who's, who's really responsible for this? And uh, um, I, I will say some, sometimes that confusion can be created at the provincial level as well when, when you have provincial politicians telling people that they can somehow do away with federal mandates. Well, no, you can't. I mean, that's just, mm -hmm. you just can't. Right. So Absolutely. every, everybody should, should try to be, be, be doing their own job really well first and foremost before, uh, before telling others what to do. Absolutely. And it was, you know, we all know that the liberal uh, it's part of the, I would say the, the left uh, reflex when you are on the left of the spectrum of the politics in Canada, that you know, uh, we know what is good for you. This is the, mm -hmm. the man, this is a thinking that those people have. I know, I know what is good for you. I know what the government, uh, as a government, I know what is good for you. Exactly the reverse angle that, that we are as a conservative, free freedom of the people, express yourself, uh, be your own boss is better than the, the government knows best. No, people knows best. So this is where we stand as a conservative. But the other side, obviously, when it is a national crisis, you are very, they were so happy, you know, to say to the provinces, well, you should have that kind of senior home. This is, this is how you should deliver a vaccine. And this is how you should apply those rules. And instead, of doing their job, like getting ready for the passport, getting ready for the immigration, they put their big nose on the provincial jurisdiction. So when you don't do what your, your job is, this is the beginning of the problem. And we have seen that with yeah. just one example, with the passport, which, which had a huge impact of yeah. thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And we know what we are talking because we are a member of parliament and we had a lot of complaints yeah. in our writings office. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and another, I guess, important principle for me is um, I think conservatives often champion the idea of subsidiarity, right? Which is that, um, that it often is, is helpful for decisions to be made at a level closer to, closer to the ground, closer to the people. Um, there are certain areas that, that should be competences of the federal government, right? Um, mm -hmm. But that as much as possible, if day-to-day -day decision in making can be most most close and most uh, responsive to, to, to immediate local priorities. Um, I guess the final question I'll, I'll throw at you, uh, jumping to the federal scene, um, I know people, people out West are often very curious about how... Um, how conservatism is doing, is going to do in Quebec. Um, 
we have a we have a new conservative leader, Pierre Poliver, yes. who's uh, um, who's uh, from Alberta, who represents a riding in Ontario. Uh, but also, we started off talking about the importance of language. Uh, and I'm not the best judge of people's French, but but I think you know, I think p- people who know would would say that his French is is impeccable, and he's uh, he's been able to connect across the country. Um, what is it? What is the mood in Quebec right now as it relates to federal politics? Is it similar to other parts of the country? Is it different? And how how are people responding to uh, uh, to Pierre's message? Well, first of all, Quebec uh, maybe it's the same same thing also in other provinces, but people are closer to their provincial government than to the federal government. So this is why polit- provincial politics is more uh, in the mood. People talk more about provincial politics than uh, federal politics. And I know what I'm talking about because I was seven years on the provincial level and seven years on the federal level. So there is, you know, more and more impact or more interest because we're talking about uh, healthcare, we're talking about school, we're talking about education, we're talking about the road, transport. It's closer to the people than us on the federal level. So this is why people are very upset when the federal uh, liberals government was not able to address and to fix the problem of the passport. So this is one point. Another point is that we have to recognize that in Quebec, there is no official link between the conservative party provincial and the federal party, uh, uh, conservative party on the federal level. We tell you the truth, I know all of them, okay? And they know me pretty well. So this is, (laughs) it's a small word. Everybody knows everybody, but there is no official link between the two party and I know that it's different in, in some provinces, and you in Alberta and uh, Ontario, and I know that people are very close. That's fine. I do respect the will of the provinces, but in my personal experience, I think that I have enough issue to address on the federal level with my with myself, with my caucus, with my people, with my party, with my leader, with my platform, than to uh, you know uh, immigrate some other issue to address on the provincial level where I have nothing to say and I have no power to influence the one case or the other. So I prefer to have the real, very good distinction between the provincial party and the federal one. And thirdly, my main point is that about Pierre, Pierre Poilier. Yes, you're right, his French is impeccable, very fantastic French, and he's very accurate, as you know, in English is very efficient is as efficient in English as in French. And I can tell you that, that uh, and I don't want to, to, to erase the, the personality of people who were there before, but this is the first time since Brian Maroney and Jean Charest that we had a real true bilingual uh, person as leader of the conservative movement in this country. So uh, it's a very good asset for us. And people are very curious about him because they don't mm-hmm. know him. Well, he's a guy, yes, a, a member from Carlton, born in Saskatchewan, study in, uh, in Calgary. So people discovered him and they were very impressed by his speech, made in speech as a leader and the speech at the caucus, a public speech at the caucus. They were very impressed. And tell you the truth also, his wife is very impressive and I had a lot of impact mm. in Quebec to speak mm. French. Because she's a petite fille de la pointe, la pointe au temple à Montréal, as she said, yeah. you know. So it's very efficient. And when Pierre said that his children are learning French, Spanish, then English, everybody knows that they already will speak English, but the yeah. first language is French, huge, big impact. And the, there is a, I would say, a positive curiosity about Pierre. They want to yeah. discover him, they want yeah. to know him better. And this is the Pierre that I know and very efficient in French, I can assure you. Yeah, well, well, uh, that's good news for us. I know sometimes, sometimes, oftentimes, I'll, I'll share with people on this podcast. We we bring people from other parties as well. So I look, yes. um, but uh, uh, you know, Jared and I obviously we we're, we're both conservatives, and Jared, it's great to have you on. Uh, I think this was notwithstanding the fact that we're from the same party, a good, rich, uh, diverse conversation here, yep. um, and we'll hopefully be be helpful to people uh, from from Western Western Canada who are thinking about. You know what would it mean for Alberta to um, to adopt some of the tools uh, and techniques that Quebec has used? Uh, your emphasis on um, uh, on how that institution building has happened as a result of the will of of the people expressed democratically. Um, you know the importance of of democracy, of rule of law, uh, of these um, these foundational principles as being the uh, uh, the metric through which. Uh, as being the, the, the passage, I should say, through which, uh, through which all ideas uh, should go. And uh, so, Gerard, thank you again for, for joining us. It's great to have you on. And uh, Thank you, Gerard. 
Yeah. Thank you so much for the invitation. I love that kind of conversation that we have and I welcome it very well. Thank you so much. Um, folks, we are doing bi-weekly episodes of Resuming Debate. Um, we, uh, we bring you conversations on all kinds of issues uh, related to what's happening in Canada and around the world. Um, uh, go back and look at old episodes if you're just joining us for this. Uh, and, uh, and we're publishing bi-weekly this fall. So uh, we'll be back with another episode in 14 days. Mm-hmm.